Um, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm plugging my phone in because it was a little um, down. Hold on a second. For sure. <clears throat> okay, I am plugged in. I'm ready. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Wendy Shaw, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I'm fantastic. It's really great to do this. I've been wanting to do this for a minute, especially after the the, the landslides. I want to ask you a bit about that, you know, how um, things that happen. Where are you right now, actually? Or, you know, lately? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm at home. Um, so I live in a rural area that is contiguous to the National Forest. And 2016, we had a Gosh, what did it ended up being? Forty thousand acre fire. So, it, as it as it happens, you know, when all the flora and fauna and trees burn down and they lose their root system, then the following winter, when there's rains, there's floods. Well, you know, my house is at the base of a of a small mountain. It's set back quite a ways, but. Um, when the water starts coming down, it all sort of joins forces and becomes this flash flood, you know, then it carries root balls and boulders and rocks and, you know, debris and all that stuff. So I got slammed with that after the fire. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you, you feel singled out? Uh, you know, there were definitely people um, around the area. Um, that were affected by flooding, but um, mine was catastrophic enough that I needed to leave uh, for about nine months while they hand dug all the mud out. <laughs> there was absolutely no way to automate it. Yeah, I had to do it the old fashioned way with buckets and shovels and wheelbarrows. There's this thing I found out about called WIOs. And wyos are the Peruvian mudslides. They're seasonal. They happen mm. because they tore down the trees, and they're crazy. They just, you know, you expect them, and they, yeah. The, some of the towns now they've passed to divert them, but usually they'll just carry roads with the buses and the trucks and the bridges themselves, and just smash, and then everything gets buried, and there's no food or water. Or, you know, people trying wow. to live off Coca Cola for a year, but uh. it sounds like it's happening to California now. Yeah, um, you know, anytime you disturb the, I mean, the natural barriers to that, which is, which are basically tra trees and plants, and I mean, that's what water works its way around. And once those aren't there, then water creates new pathways, and and there's just nothing to stop it. I mean, if it's going in a downhill trend, water will always seek the lowest level, and and then as it goes, it sort of picks up speed and momentum and and stuff. Exactly, yeah. It, uh, I, I actually have surveillance cameras around my house, and I was able to capture it. So if, if it that. wasn't, if it's not your house, it's actually kind of entertaining. Wow. You know? Well, yeah. so some more, some more about you, because I think by now everyone could figure it out. Your voice, I think they've all heard Francine on American Dad, which is still going strong. Where you at? Which is like 14th season now? Yeah, we're in our 14th season. We're about halfway through it. That's, <laughs> well, yeah, it's, you know, like Simpsons and South Park. This is one of the ones that, it's, it's one of the different ones I've always noticed. It has, um, it's a deeper plot uh, driven show, you know, even more than The Simpsons or Family Guy. Um, but you go like, in selective memory of film i've seen you just in everything i think you were in like welcome back cotter <laughs> and john triple is my birthday so it's the only reason to bring that up but like knight rider oh, really? MacGyver, even x files like you know all of these things over the years who do you, like do you feel like any of these people you portray or like you know who you've portrayed or do you feel like different like how do you feel compared to like francine or any of this no, I mean, I really, it's, it's a job. I don't, I don't know how many actors would really say that they were changed by a role that they played. I mean, you might be changed by um, 
experiences that you had doing it or the learning curve or something like that because that's the kind of thing that um, makes us who we are, whatever our experiences are. But to say, you know, oh, I played a, you know, somebody who did a bank heist or I pay, played an abusive mother or I played a this or that, like, no, you know, I mean, it, 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 there are shoes that you step into for a period of time, but hopefully, unless you're playing Gandhi or something, you don't become those, those characters, you know, uh, in, in any way. No. I'm hard pressed. You know, it, it's really interesting because some of these things come back around even today. I've been asked to do um, interviews for, well, I think I did a Knight Rider interview and um, I'm like, okay, but this was so long ago. Can you send me a clip of what I did? I don't even remember. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no. that gets me though into the next question. You kind of halfway answered it, which is like, what is your spiritual outlook? Like, it seems like your philosophy. Um, you know, I guess, um, I guess I'm sort of a humanist. So I'm a little sciencey. So I loved the book Sapiens that is all about, you know, our our story um, of becoming human. And um, that's what really fascinates me. And I, even if I have um, an experience that, you know, you would consider, quote, spiritual or whatever, I never draw a big equal sign. Oh, because I had this dream about my grandmother sitting opposite me after she died and, you know, showing me all as well. Thou that equals that, you know, people come back, come back from, you know, after they're, they've passed away or there's past lives or I, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of take my experiences as they are and about life or our story or, or what we're doing here. I think it's amazing that, you know, as, as soon as you have, you know, an experience or you're looking at something, whether, you know, it's a beautiful sunset or roadkill, <laughs> you know, the first thing you want to do is grab somebody else and share the moment. Um, hold on a second. I just need to, I need to greet my, my guy here. Okay. <laughs> Recorded kiss. Righteous. <laughs> my my connection. <laughs> um, I just kind of take my experiences as they are and sort of think, well, that's interesting. I think that's part of being human. And um that doesn't make me any less reverent about you know what I'm saying? I, I that that that's the thing that makes yeah, that it, makes it us plays so... into what's going on with transhumanism right now, right? Because there's a lot of people who say, "Okay, I'm a humanist," or "I'm not a, I'm not a religious person," but then they want to use science, and science is sort of this, you know, magic thing you can do to DNA and make people live forever, or even turning people. You know, let's say you switch bodies someday. You know, how are you going to do it? You're going to have to transmit through data. You might become light for a moment. So there's this idea of like light beings you were in that movie batteries not included which is kind of like a mystical shintoist flying toaster movie about light beings living in electronics right yeah i have i have no interest in that i hope i'm i'm dead and gone before we become a robot society <laughs> i know i love the connection of of people you know, and the capacity that people have. I just don't see a point in trying to, you know, um, duplicate that um, for cheaper labor or for, you know, to do stuff faster. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a whole generation older than you. And guess what? I mean, we don't have any more leisure time today than I experienced in the 60s or 70s. In fact, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And we have so many more things to babysit now, you know, all of our online stuff and all that, that, um, you know, we're, we're losing our, our kickback time. We're losing our, our stroll, 
you know, and, um, you know, if, if that part of science that has to do with that technology, I have zero interest in. <laughs> That's the absolute right answer for everybody, I'm pretty sure. Um, I kind of want to ask a bit about your dad, Richard. I could go in a lot of different directions. Um, I'll mention when he first got into, quote, show business, um, he, we lived in Illinois. We were all from the Chicago area. And he was one of the original Second City members. Mm-hmm. So he went into Second City, which is, was the very, it was the start of improvisation for the theater. So, 1616 um, North Wells Street. Yeah. It's a crazy building yeah. still there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, they were, they started in Lincoln um, Circle. So, uh, I think they moved once from their really humble beginnings. And I was actually in it. When I was nine and a half, I, uh, I was in a children's workshop with Viola Spolin. And I was so shy that I think she was just trying to, like, bring me out a little bit. But, um, yeah, that was, that was in uh, Lincoln Circle. I think that's what that's called. Um, but, you know, so he was, uh, my dad was always artistic. He, he was really at the cutting edge of something. So I, I, I felt like I was part of something that kind of everyday citizens didn't have a handle on, you know. Um, it, was, it was something special. Um, and then just him, I mean, he was always, he was always coming up with ideas. He was always, um, in the process of creating something, whether it be a painting because he was a fine artist or he was going to redo a house. (laughs) So see, my grandmother was first generation American. So yeah, my, well, my father's mother was Scottish. And she came over on the boat uh, when she was nine. And they were so poor coming from Scotland. She said whenever the dinner bell rang, they were always the first ones, you know, <laughs> running to, <laughs> to get food. And my grandfather on my, on my uh, father's side was German, 100% uh, German. So, um, but he was second generation. Yeah. So he was born, you know, I mean, he was born in the, in the United States, you know. Um, and on my mother's side, they were English, some more German and English. Hmm. Actually, I need to do the 23 and me. Um, I just want to know how much uh, Neanderthal I have in me. That sort of fascinates me. <laughs> yeah, I'd be careful about them doing it, but for the same reason, I would. I would want. I want. To I know. <laughs> I know. I want GPS to tell me where to turn, but I don't want Big Brother to know where I am. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, you're right. A new option. Well, okay. So your dad, he sounds like he was more than just an entertainer. So, like, he went. He, and you said he got into that kind of you were young it so he started into that at some point like what was so what what happened how did that all go down so yeah so he started you know in second city and i would go there with him sometimes and see the shows and um and then um he followed second city to new york because they were opening one there and I believe that's when he really got an agent and started uh, going out for acting roles that were aside from, you know, improv theater. And, uh, and man, if, if some of the people watching this, his first movie was The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming. Hmm. And that movie completely holds up. Like, get get it on Netflix or whatever it's on and sit there and watch it. It is freaking hilarious, and it holds up because it's about human nature. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, uh, so I didn't live with him. So my parents were, you know, divorced from the time I was, I don't know, three or four. 
Um, so I didn't live with him until I was 14. Um, and um, I flew to New York uh, to live with he and Valerie Harper. You know, he was married to her for 15 years. She was, I think at one time, I don't know what her exact, but she was one of the biggest television stars during the 70s um, from Mary Tyler Moore and Rhoda um, days. So, um, yeah, once I, once I went to live with them, I saw a little bit more about what an actor's life was. I mean, the actual nuts and bolts of, them, you know, preparing for auditions and, um, you know, waiting to hear if they got roles, getting the roles, working the whatever the job. Um, so I kind of, you know, grew up with that part of it after I was 14. And then when I was in high school, people would say, oh, do you want to be an actress like your father? And I think I said something like, no, like I don't. I don't want to pretend to be someone else. I just want to be me or some really like <laughs> something very ridiculous reasonable for a, teenage... for a human being to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I thought it sounded really deep at the time. <laughs> when did you do Bound for Glory? When, when did that happen? The Woody Guthrie Bound thing? for Glory was the was the first job that I got from an audition. Hmm. So. Um, that was really interesting. Um, working with David Carradine and we were all in that central California, like Bakersfield. Yeah. What was um, Carradine like? Um, yeah, he was just the consummate, you know, hippie <laughs> kind of laid back. I mean, actually, I don't know that he was really good casting for that role because <laughs> I understand that, <laughs> that, um, that Guthrie was really wiry and hyper and that sort of thing. And Carradine is like very, you know, kicked back, laid back. Um, I had an occasion to, to go to his hotel room and no, nothing happened. Um, it was, <laughs> I was just with another girl and um, uh, we stopped in and he had the mattresses, the beds taken out of his room so he could be kind of closer to the earth. Well, I think he was on the <laughs> second floor of a Ramada Inn or something. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just silly to, you know, like you were laying on the ground. You were laying on some styrofoam-backed carpeting or something. From, yeah. But that was that was a really interesting thing to work on because there were a lot of iconic um, folk singers. You know, Pete Seeger came to visit and um, just drew people to to the shoot that were fun and interesting to meet. And uh, again, I think because of my father and Valerie. They had every Bob Dylan album. They had every, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary. So I was growing up with with that the mm -hmm. folk music anyway. By the time I was doing the movie, then I was listening to, you know, all the... Because it was the time of the Beatles and the um, Rolling Stones and, um, you know, right. Three Dog Night and... Um, I mean, just all the rock and roll icons, Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and the Doors and, you know, all, everybody. So, yeah, I was kind of out of the folk music scene because I think I was, uh, maybe I was 21 or something when we, when we shot that movie. Hmm. So. Do you remember when, when Slaughterhouse Five, when did that go down? Do you think you remember? So, about so I was 17 and a junior in high school and my father got this movie um, that was shooting in Prague. So, and it's 1971. So he thought it would be a great educational experience for me to go with him. Now, the, the, 
he was only supposed to shoot for 10 days. So he was thinking, okay, I'll take her out of school for a week, you know, and when we'll pick up some homework, you know, to, to bring with. So, of course, the weather didn't cooperate, and we ended up in Prague for five weeks, and I had to go to summer school. But um, he was right that it was a really, really interesting experience, and an education that only travel and seeing how other people live can impact you. Um, That, you know, reading a book or hearing about it later is just not going to happen. So the reason I bring up the year, but um, 1971, um, Czechoslovakia was a, quote, Iron Curtain country, and they were under Russian rule. Um. So, any of your young listeners that think it's a great idea to be socialistic and, you know, communistic, I'll tell you what, it isn't. <laughs> um, it, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what hit me the most. Um, when you don't have, um, when you don't have a certain amount of competition, then you don't have quality. Um, There's different kinds of competition. Um, Healthy competition in business makes you want to make a better shoe than the guy down the street so that people come and buy your shoes. That didn't exist there. Um, If you were a shoemaker, the government was going to tell you how much you could charge, how much you could make for a pair of shoes. So the quality of goods um, in the, you know, during that period of time was terrible. And what, then what they had to compensate for that was, I think they were called Tuzix stores. Um, they were kind of like department stores where they brought in Western products where you could actually didn't, you buy a, an umbrella that didn't inflate or you know, something that just wouldn't disintegrate. The problem was is that in order to shop in those stores, um, you had to use Western money. So (laughs) what that created then was a big black market. So everybody, you were constantly being, you know, kind of hawked on the street to change money because they wanted to change the um, Czechoslovakian crown and hellers into German marks or English uh, pounds or American dollars so that you could, you know, go to some of these stores and buy, you know, buy goods. Um, You know, I met a woman whose lifelong dream was to be a race car driver, and the closest she could get to that was teaching driver's ed. Um, Met a couple. She was Czech. He was German. Um, He did uh, business in, in Prague, so you know he would come and visit her, but the government wouldn't let them get married because then that meant she could leave. It's all that stuff, you know. That um, just uh, my dad. <laughs> I don't know whether this was like the best judgment call, but he loved like really, you know, well designed things and and the small things, and so he had. Um, a Minox camera in those days, which was a spy camera. It was this like a, it was like a little bit bigger than a tube of lipstick, you know. And you just pulled it apart, and when you clicked it back, it it took the picture. Well, can you get you know, those pictures? People... What is that a thing? <laughs> well, then they had a little roll of film in it, and you'd have to take it and get it, you know, I have, developed. I have all the equipment. I have all the film equipment. Do you do you remember? You said this was seventy one. 1971? Yeah. Yeah. So this is four years after the Prague Spring and the um, Velvet Curtain, right? We talk about the Emerald Curtain, but the Velvet Curtain, because, you know, that the, they, these guys in Prague who were told they could not be into their 
alternative interests. That's a, another thing was beyond competition. They didn't want in, anybody who was into those things. You had all these university students. They opened the doors, the gates, and they they said, get out of the Czechoslovakian state because the Russians were coming with tanks. And that's where you get like Steve Martin and Dan Aykroyd as two wild and crazy guys, right? Because yeah. that's the exodus of the crazies. But you were there after, you know, and people had been burning themselves who were stuck there. They were like, I can't do socialist agriculture with, I'm going to just send them a self-immolation. And it's like, cra- <laughs> wow. So uh, 1971 must have been the craziest time to be there. Did you, what was the first thing you thought when you got there and you saw like the architecture, you know? Oh my God, what a beautiful city. And that's the thing about the Czechoslovakians. They are so innovative and so artistic and it's just their problem is they're you know they don't have any natural borders so they're surrounded on all sides by (coughs) excuse me by other nations the architecture was stunning um i went to a movie there um uh that was so far ahead of its time uh it had a row of buttons on the seat back in front of of each seat and they would stop the movie and um, actually I I think it was like interactive where, well, it was definitely interactive with the audience, but also um, somebody would come out and talk, um, you know, uh, in the middle of the movie. And of course it was all in check. So I was just, you know, (laughs) guessing what was going on, but what they were doing was asking you which direction you wanted the storyline to go. So, um, and you'd all vote. So by pushing these, these buttons and, you know, it would do this tally thing and then the movie would go off in that direction um, for a while until the next sort of impasse would, would come. So, you know, there, um, you know, it, it, was, it was sad to see them stifled by, you know, the potential, um, well, that they have now. I mean, I have always had, but could, you know, freely express, you know. Yeah, and the scene with your dad in that movie, because, like, that's, if, you know, I remember being way too young to see that scene where he picks up the little statue, you know, in the rubble of Dresden, and then, you know, they're going to shoot him for it. It's like very impactful remember that wow i haven't seen that movie i think since it's come out um so i don't have such a big recollection i remember them being in some kind of bunker and he played an american nazi (laughs) and what he was he was trying to talk them out of communism You know, I mean, I guess the Nazis weren't communists. I mean, it was a dictatorship, but they weren't communists. So somehow, yeah, had an interesting take on all that. Yeah, because I I remember his wardrobe was like this Nazi uniform, but it was all red, white, and blue. And that American stars and stripes on it and... Um, yeah, it's 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 a weird thing because you know <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut is supposed to be telling this like story of somebody who survived like a um, nuclear space time rift. You know, so Billy Pil- Pilgrim, right? He's a pilgrim, and right, he, right, right. He gets unstuck in time, and he's traveling through different ordered events, including time in Dresden, and also on like. Tralfamador, Tralfamador, I think is like the planet with the weird alien. It's basically Roger, right? You know, from American Dead. <laughs> they just continued on after Kurt Vonnegut, but <laughs> it's pretty weird. Yeah, so definitely like the multiverse story. And everyone talks about Rick and Morty, but maybe Kurt Vonnegut is more, more the thing. He always does that. It seems like he he always spends some time kind of in the forties and. And then way in the future and, um, you know, somehow marries the storyline throughout time. I was reading Titan Find when, when we were there. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, what was the other book he wrote where he's describing, he's trying to describe um, li- life on, on Earth 
to somebody who wouldn't know anything. And I remember there was like this this pencil or pen drawing of girls' underpants. They were it was just like a black line. <laughs> they had no details. It was in the book. Oh, in, hilarious. In, Titan? in the Titan one or No, it was in another Well um Kurt Vonnegut, I feel like I would be um wrong not to ask you about inner space the internautic kabbalistic adventure of a nanoscopic being who's miniaturized in a secret <laughs> experiment played, played by dennis quaid and accidentally injected <laughs> into jacob putter putter being to be idle and jacob being the name of israel played by martin short did you i know you feel like the inner space what were you thinking of that 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 screenplay wow after that description, I can tell you've thought about it a lot more than I did as an actress. <laughs> uh, and no, I don't think I I looked into any deeper meaning. Is there? I mean, <laughs> you besides, besides me. the fact that it's about the tree of life, you you've been into some selectly interesting stories and films even like fantasy island you know is a pretty weird thing like in is contemporarily important with like elite islands having their fantasies played out somewhere above the law like do you think there could be real fantasy islands um well i think it would be i think it would be too expensive <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah these days <laughs> they they did things that were, you know, a step into magical, you know, I mean, where two old ladies go and their dream is to relive their days and do in the follies, you know, the follies brugere and, you know, and suddenly they're young and they're, you know, so, um, as, as far as, uh, you know, doing some kind of, you know, time travel or recapturing <laughs> somebody's experience. It's like, how would anybody know how to duplicate that? And and then you're not in the same mentality than, than you were experiencing um, something maybe the first time around. Um, yes, yeah, the most expensive psychotherapy, that show. You know, playing out the yeah, fantasies exactly. to fix things for people. Like, very good stalt. Well, yeah, I no, hope you get on the he, new... You should be on that show, What's He's Doing in Space, Orville or something. You better put you on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I kind of stopped doing live action. I, I mean, I would do it if it... You know, if it was people I knew and for friends and, you know, well, that sort of thing. But I'm kind true. of spoiled now. I don't really want to be in a makeup chair at 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And, <laughs> you, you know, that. I've done it and it's been good. And, and, you know, I'm kind of, you know, like, why can't I enjoy Easy Street for the last part of my career? I mean, I'm going to be retirement age next year. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I have this great job. It's enough money. It's, you know, I, I'm comfortable with my life and, you know, how much I um dedicate to work and how much free time i have and <laughs> yeah you're great as the voice of our generation i, I appreciate that because it's timeless i got a couple ones for you that are kind of abstract like what's something you don't usually get the chance to talk about that you're interested in huh wow that is so like off the cuff, wow, I'm a little bit stumped, I guess. <laughs> You're going to have to cut around this big pause. <laughs> no, you got the good pause voice. I mean, it's a question about like what, you know, people don't always think that you're thinking about, you know, never judge a book by its cover, like. Well, one of my friends is a manager at JPL. Um, you know, he was on the Cassini project and he's, uh, uh, on the, on another Mars project and, hmm, well, I'm in wonder on my property a lot because 
I get to see bobcats and deer and bunnies and, you know, a blue jay taking a bath and the bird bath. And I like tromping around this area and, um, you know, hiking all up in the hills. And lately my stream bed has been running continuously. Um, so I, I guess I, I spend some time in nature and think about it and, you know, that's, it's part of my life because of where I live. You know, I get the economist and I go right back to the science section and, uh, another friend who, uh, it was beginning of life. That's not the right term. Um, it was all about the, the start of life um, on the planet, reading articles about science and especially about early man. Um, I was really interested in being an anthropologist um, before I became an actress. So, um, you know, that's, it's just part of what I like to read about and, and, and think about. What do you think about you? What would you do in the event of an apocalypse? Well, what do you mean? I'd go down like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me rephrase. <laughs> Next time the mud hits, what what, what are you going to do now that you've been through it? Oh, you mean just another natural disaster? Or any kind of the next uh. disaster? you know, walk through it like you, like you have to deal with everything else. You know, I think it was Robert Downey Jr. that I heard quoted that whatever the percentage is, it was a huge percentage. 95% of life is maintenance. And that, it unfortunately, maybe we would have been better to stay as hunter-gatherers. We, but with all this stuff we have, it's like all we do is rebuild and fix and clean and replace and upgrade and and that sort of thing so when disaster strikes it you're either going to walk away from it and start over or you're going to rebuild you use the word apocalypse i mean we've had many so um i want to survive and do the right thing and take care of the planet and each other like everybody else but I also don't get too precious about it. Oh, if you look at the history, there's been big disasters that have wiped out whatever the living beings were at the time over and over again. It's not just the dinosaurs. <laughs> there was a whole group of mammals that lived before them, gone. You know, but things things change, things come and go. That's that's what it's all about. It's like create and destroy, create and destroy. That's that's how life goes. Have you heard that thing about the humanoids? You were saying actually, so I guess you have that you want to know how much Neanderthal is in you. So there's it. There's a lot about the, the simultaneous homin humanoids that were living at the same time, and that they were all interbreeding, and that were actually many of them make up our different genotypes in the different humans around the planet. Okay, what do you think about like the alternatives or the change, the way history and science and evolution has been revised, the information of the Neanderthal? I think they're the only other species that we... We could not completely you know, genotype like the Florensis, but we, we look at likely Florensis as well and several others, right? Like the um, Australopithecus and the Hy yep. Hyalurgensis. Yeah, the Denisovan and the Neanderthal, I think the two confirmed, and then there's evidence to suggest the Florensis, and then people say things about the Capensis, but it's not confirmed yet. But at least two, because Denisovan in the Bulgars. But wasn't Florensis the one that was tiny. either um, Australia or they were on a completely different continent, weren't they? So the idea is the Java Major, which is where Australia and Indonesia is, the region of Papua New Guinea and like the Krakatoa, there's an out of there into Africa theory with multiple races at the same time. Florensis, Capensis, Australopithecus, Heidelbergens, and Neanderthal and Denisovan all coming from there. 
which is like a new competing uh, theory. It's not that new. It's like since the 70s, but it's been more and more confirmed since genomics or genetics have hmm. shown that there's been interbreeding and they're not just one long line from one to the right. other. You know? Right. Yeah, I know. I think that's absolutely... The other thing that I think is so fantastic to muse about, the idea... Because, again, we, we're, we're very concerned with telling our story and, and with history and um, understanding our mythology. And when you think about how, not just how many humans and, and other species lived for hundreds of thousands of years, when you think about all those dramas that played out, that we never will, we'll never know those stories, how many stories there were to tell. I mean, and among the animal kingdom too, but it kind of blows my mind when I try to think about people that, that lived before us and oh, just how many stories there were to tell that we'll never know. His and her story, history. So perhaps more positively, where do you see California headed now after all this and disasters? And where do you see the world headed? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think we're becoming more global. I mean, I think it's silly to fight against it. I mean, we're all we're going to have to figure it out, though. We can't can't be. What is the term I, I want to say? I, I think we can't all insist on having it our way or, or the highway and be global, you know, at the, at the same time. We're going to have to figure out how to do this peacefully one way or the other. If we don't, I mean, we're really, we're going to end up annihilating each other. California, that's, that's a whole other kind of focus, huh? I think, I mean, I don't know what California does with the money. It really kind of pisses me off. I pay more taxes than God, and there's there's never any money, and, and they just try to think of new ways to, to get more money to, you know, cover all this stuff. And then you look at other states where they don't have any sales tax, and they're just doing fine. So I don't know. I don't have... I don't have a lot of respect for California and a lot of the politics and what they think is a good idea. We'll see. I mean, it's just going to get more and more expensive, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I can agree with all of that. Well, I really appreciate that you did this. This is really fantastic. I got a lot out of that. You know what? You are, I think, the best interview I, viewer I've ever <laughs> talked to because you you know so much and your curiosity is specific and interesting so this is the best thank you so much bless you bless your family uh, really um, thanks that. for it not being a big bore <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody tune in to recent Tartarians Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarians. Okay, now I owe you money. <laughs>